eternal truth. We thank you for this opportunity to be with our teacher. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. We've got a lot of stuff to cover in the next few weeks. We're probably going to have about four weeks or something like that to go, maybe five. I want to make this the best church history class that I've ever done. And the people are hitting it on the website like, I cannot believe, I, I can't believe how they're going after this church history. It is really surprising because the average person you think would be bored to death. Marilyn, uh, she, uh, she, church history opened your eyes more than anything else. Now, you've sat in church history classes five or six times with me. And I think church history is her very favorite subject. The best one. Uh, Ken Blinn said he learned more doctrine in church history than he did in any class that he ever studied for in theology ever. And I've really, I've always tried to teach it really good. But I used to teach church history for two years. Girls. It's getting on the tape, okay? <clears throat> I tried to do the best I can. And this time I'm trying to do it the best I ever did. But I taught it for two years in the seminary. One year in Europe, and then the other year in America. Now, I, I can't make it like that and take two years. And I taught it two hours a week, you know, for uh, <clears throat> Whisper a little quieter, okay? I want you to pay attention, all right? All right, this is going all over the world now. I want you to know that. <coughs> it's not just here. All right, we've studied. Where were we last week, Marilyn? Where did we end up? End up? You want me, do you think they might need a microphone over there? <laughs> Where did we finish up last week, Brother Mike? <coughs> Around about 1,300, 1,400, didn't we? Around 13 and 1400, we began to, to talk about uh, the. Uh, talk about Wycliffe yet? Yeah, we, we hit Wycliffe a little bit. Now, we keep studying. I forgot to bring my one book this week that had some stuff in it that I needed. Uh, anyway, we're going, we're at this period of time right now for the. The History of the Evangelical Churches of the, of the Valleys of Piedmont. And I haven't got this ordered yet. But uh, I'm going to order one of these for you, Brother Mike. And we're going to study some of these things. I'm going to have, the, I have you look centered around and we'll let you look at it a little bit. We really need to pa not pass over quickly the part that we're in right now. Because right now, what happened, what's happening in church history right now, it, it really ought, we ought to pay attention to it. Because it's very important. Because it affects all of church history. Last week we were studying, and we got over to the uh, <clears throat> what caused, and we're still there today. What caused the Reformation? Why did the Reformation happen? Now, Dakota is studying at school, and you're probably going to study about the Reformation and the Renaissance and all this. By the way, the Renaissance and the Reformation happened about the same time. I wonder why. What was the Renaissance? Oh, you did. Now, let me tell you it the right way. What, what happened in the Renaissance? What happened? What, what does the Renaissance mean, basically? Wakening up or rebirth. All right. Why did the world go into the Dark Ages? Why did we have to have a Dark Age? It was because of the Catholic. The Catholic Church brought the Dark Ages on the world. Right. Now, <clears throat> we have, we're living in a world today where the very militant, uh, we're living in an extremely religiously militant world. Anybody disagree? All right. In the Middle East right now, we got two groups fighting over there. We got the Christians fighting against the Muslims. Is this the first time this ever happened? It's for different reasons today than what happened back in the Dark Ages. Remember, the Dark Ages did not exist in the Muslim world at that time. Basically, later on is when they went reverted back. Because when, when 
the Western world was growing into the Dark Ages, it was by the power of Catholicism, taking the Bible away from people, uh, uh, enslaving thousands to be peons. All right? Thousands were being peons. They, they were, what is a peon? A slave. A slave. It is a, uh, uh, basically a slave. Now, the world, history is bound to repeat itself. How many of the ruling class in the world are there? How, what percentage do you think the ruling class in the world is today? And the wealthy and the ruling class? What, what percent do you think it is? It's probably around less than 5%. Less than 5%. We're talking about America, too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about history. What is one of the most beautiful states in the, in the United States of America? Or in America, what is one of the most beautiful states? The, the mildest climates. Go back in history, three hundred years ago. What is California. California? When these Forty ers came to Los Angeles, when they went down to Los Angeles, Los Angeles was a sleepy little Mexican village. All right. A sleepy little Mexican village. Now, how long ago? When, when Maryland? Florida. Your dad was born in Los Angeles, wasn't he? Yes. What kind of a town was it when he was born there? Small. Very small little town. Okay. And that was in 1896. Her dad was born in, in Los Angeles in 1896. It was a very sleepy little town. Matter of fact, he his father had a dairy. Uh, a dairy right in downtown. Where was it? It was. Thir- he was born at 34th and McClinic, uh, where the dental college is at USC. At USC, but that was a farm at that time. It was a dairy farm. A dairy farm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, <clears throat> in 1849, you know that's 150 something, 660 years ago, you know, almost. People from the east ran to California. Why did the people come to California, Marilyn? They came to, they thought Los Angeles was for tubercular and for good health. Okay, why did the people from the east come to California? Because of the weather. Uh, Dakota. Why did they come? In 1849, why did people come? Gold. All right, we got we got you now. Gold. All right, gold. That's why they came to California was gold. And what does gold represent? Wealth. Wealth. So they came to California. They left their farms back there, and they lived on farms, and they had lots to eat. They had uh, they had homes. There was a lot of water back there. There was a lot of cattle, sheep, goats, uh, all kinds of game back there. Because back east, uh, what kind of... Uh, Marilyn, what? have you been back east? As far as the, uh, the bridge at St. Louis. At St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri, yes. Okay, what did it look like? It was a nice looking town. And a lot of trees? Lots of trees. Lots of trees, lots of water, lots of wood. And a lot of those trees back there have wild nuts on them, don't they? So all out there, all this stuff, but, but you have to clear the land to farm it, don't you? Okay, you had to clear the land to farm it. Right. You had got to take all these trees out, pull the pull the trunks up, and everything else to farm the land. It's a lot of work, and you farm the land, okay? Because you have a lot of weeds and stuff back there. All kinds of thistles and things are back there. Well, out here in California, when these guys that went out here and they came into Southern California, you know what they found down there? They couldn't even find a job. If they didn't go to the gold mines, they couldn't even find a job. Why? Why? What kind of business did they have down there in Southern California, Maryland, back in those times? What? 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 What made? How they make their living back there? How? How was the old uh, Californios? Ranches. Well, ranches. They ranched and had gardens. All right. Did they have very many fences? No. No. No fences. You'd have to ride fence to <coughs> gather up your cattle or anything. What did you have to do for a living? Be a cowboy. 
cowboy. That was all. You just went around. You lived on a horse and and, and ran around and uh, gathering up cows. And that's all. Branding them, butchering whatever else, skinning them, making uh, riding apparel and whatever. That was it. The gardens that they had, almost every family had a, a, a home garden. They didn't have great big farms. Also, had, uh, like, my grandfather had uh, an orchard. Yeah, had a lot of orchards. They would take the apricots to market. Mm-hmm. And my dad was a little tiny kid, and they'd go down to do the market yeah. and sell the things. And my grandfather could speak several languages, and he could speak uh, Chinese. Well, all of this happened back there, but there wasn't a lot of labor involved in it. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? A lot of labor. There were no poor people in California. Mm-hmm. No poor people in California. You know what brought on poverty in California? Probably. Rich people came out here and they built industry. The big, the big farms, the big ranches, and the big mines. And when you have mines, you have to have workers, don't you? And people would go on there and they'd work hard. And back in the back in the east, what were people? Tennessee, Ernie Ford sang a song. What was it? Sold my soul to the company store. I sold my soul to the company store. Another, they older and another deeper and deeper in debt. Then that's what it was. They were slaves, peons. Okay. That was one of the things that the 49ers, when they came out in California, they said everybody was free. They they lived in a, a free, carefree life. They had plenty to eat. The, the grass grew on the plains for so their cattle, whatever, you know. They had little little family gardens and, and everything. It just, it was an easy life. But then after the big gold mines and all this and the big city started and even when Los Angeles and people would give to each other, they could not believe the liberality. One family down there that lived uh, uh, near New Hall, these 49ers were coming off coming back here and there were hundreds of them come there and this one family where this road ended those people would go out there this one family came there uh, uh, Manley and Rogers when they came up there and they brought the uh, the uh, family that was actually the families that were stranded in in uh, Death Valley they brought them up there and when they got up there they the, the women ran out there and they grabbed their women because they were women and little children and they just cried and hugged them these these were mostly Spanish and Mexican people and they'd give the little kids oranges and they had orange trees all kinds of stuff and they cooked food for them and they were sitting there and everybody and even the cowboys would come out there and tears would be running down their face to see the poverty these people most of them had lost over 100 pounds and they were just walking skeletons and they said in sign language because they were speaking Spanish what can we do for you and they said we want fresh meat fresh meat and they said well, this one this one cowboy went out there and roped the steer and brought it up there a two year old fatted calf cut its throat and said there it is and gave it to him and they just gorged themselves on this and they asked him into their homes and everything and this one family had made over well, hundreds of people welcome like this. Can you imagine that? Finally, the guy became a senator or a governor of California one time. That family. The, the, the Vowell family or something like that. But they lived in what was called Little San Francisco Ranch. The Little San Francisco Ranch. Francisco Ranch. In Europe, <coughs> there were the princes and the paupers. The Catholicism. The Roman Empire would have probably fallen apart had it not been for Catholicism. Catholicism married religion to the state and it was one religion. What is going to be the religion in the book of Revelation? Over here in the book of Revelation, the tribulation period, is there going to be a one world religion? Well, the two Babylons by Alexander <coughs> Hislop, Sir Alexander Hislop, I believe, I think it was ninety, talks about this type of thing. History repeats itself. Remember when we were studying the plagues this morning? And I and why were they given to us? Why are they written down in the Bible? For us to remember. For us to remember those things. Let's remember history too, or we're bound to repeat it. What's going to happen back over here in the tribulation period? 
History is going to be repeated again. It's going to bring the dark ages, basically. People are going to be starving to death because they're going to be their souls are going to be sold for their a whole day's wages is going to just only feed them a very meager meager. They're going to be peons. They're going to be paupers. All through church history, we've seen this. We've seen a, a wrestling match, a war between the rich and the poor, and the rich are very high. And in the worst parts of history, the riches, the rich people are very wealthy, and the poor are very poor. That's greed, is what it is. It is greed. When there's great, such a great difference there. Now. <clears throat> What brought on the Reformation? Poverty and uh, the poverty and the absolute despondency, the depression of the dark ages over the people. What did these people live like? The average person in, in the dark ages, just like animals. And what did the rich and the wealthy live like? Opulent clothing that was just unbelievable, gold threads in it, just beautiful clothing, fancy shoes. They had uh, servants all around, constant servants, which were just, even if you got to be a king's servant, you were something. By the way, in the Death Valley 49ers, the only family that took a wagon to California was the King of England's coachman. He drove it all the way from the East Coast. They landed in New York. And he ended up driving all the way through and drove right into Los Angeles. He was the only one because he used his head. He went by rules and discipline. He carried water, too. The rest of them expected to have a stream all the way. And they had been uh, uh, misled to think that there were places to camp all the way and plenty of water. But he prepared. And his wife was a tutor to the... Uh, the ambassador from France. These people came out of the palaces, but they were working people. But they came and they made it through all right. Well, the Europe, <clears throat> the Europe of the Dark Ages, people began to hear the Word of God. Baptists had to hide out. They had to hide to believe what they believed. This is where we have the Mennonites. This is where we have the people that that looked differently than anybody else. What caused this great massacre here? The history of the evangelical churches of the valleys of these people. Did it simply Satan hating Christians? You have seen this type of thing. Yeah, I've seen that. Have you seen this, brother? I read Fox's book of Martyrs. Have you seen it? These are real people. Okay, and that, yeah. you know, the, a certain Assyrians did that a yeah. lot too. Yeah, well, that's, that's who invented in Palin. But it's always from the same ungodly. This is what they did to Christians. This is the Catholic Church, how the Catholic Church treated Christians. These people had names. These are not just vague happenings. These people had names. These people really lived. And they really existed. And they really did what they did to these people here. Hanging them up and skinning them alive. These really happened. These people had names. The woman of St. Giovanni, whose name is credibly believed, was <coughs> so and so and so forth. Wife of of uh, uh, Mr. Barrow, <coughs> after she had been several others uh, tore most cruelly put to death. This is these are the people <coughs> that really happened to those people. The power of the Catholic Church. How did they find these people in the valleys of Big Mouth? <coughs> well, they needed supplies. And uh, how do men and I stress in the old days? Most of the men you could tell a Mennonite. Oh, yeah. 
All right. Can you tell an Amish? <coughs> yeah. An Amish person, can you tell that? You know, I can still tell an older Mennonite today. They're out and out. <coughs> I can look at a group of people together and know that they're Mennonites. Yeah. Just by the way they carry themselves, the way they dress. By the way they dress. When this man went down for supplies, they saw him. And they said, that is a Anabaptist. And so they sneaked around and they followed him back and found the way into the valleys where he lived. And they got a group together and they went in there to torture and kill him. Last week we talked about ravaging and drowning people and going in and destroying whole villages. Whole villages. And they... <clears throat> one king said as we quoted last week remember what he said Marilyn kill last week the king said go into these villages and kill everyone man, woman and child God knows who's his no matter you kill them all the, the, God will save the, the ones that are his and the other ones will just go to hell basically just go kill them all Murder every one of them. Now, <clears throat> in the Middle East today, what is the Muslim tenet of evangelism? What do they believe? Well, you either accept it or you die by the sword. That's right. Now, <clears throat> you have to realize that when the Muslim religion came on the scene, there was a very powerful religion that had begun to do. What did Christianity do? How did they make converts in 5 and 6 and 700 A.D.? The same way. They did it by the sword. You went out and you conquered whole nations and you held a sword to their throat and you say, I will slit it or you confess and be baptized. Of course, they'd dip them. If they'd either <laughs> sprinkle their blood or they would dip them one or the other. That's what it is. They'd pour the blood out or the throats or else they'd baptize them. And that's the way they they convert. Now, what about those converts? Do you think they really believed? No. no. Probably hated them. And when you made those kind of converts and you got them into the church, when you got lost people into the church, what happens? You've got problems. When you get lost leaders into the church, you've got problems. I uh, I read this to uh, <coughs> someplace. I guess I ought to get this on tape. D.S. Madden's statement about churches. It's something he wrote about church discipline. And something he said, actually, I when he said it, I wrote it down. Now, you have to remember... <coughs> that there was no difference between a lost man and a church member at all in Catholicism. Both are lost. Okay? And both are in the church. D.S. Madden said, If all the whores and whoremongers and liars and beer guzzlers, cigarette suckers, winos, drunkards, dancers, gamblers, card players, bingo nuts, bums, and low lice would get saved before they joined God churches, the churches would not have to suffer so much in disciplining these ungodly buzzards. Now what if you got this type of people running the church? What do you got? What do you got when you got these people running the church? Well, that's what Catholicism was. Catholicism was that lost society. And they were manipulating people, manipulating the masses. The church state became one, and they were powerful, and they were militant. And when the Muslim world con congregated and got together, then the Christians, so-called, went and started conquering. Now, the Baptist. How does, ba how does Baptist evangelize people? How do they evangelize people? How do you proselyte? How does a Baptist proselyte people? 
How did I ever proselyte you, Brother Mike? How did I get proselyte you, huh? This teaching you. Teaching you the Word of God. He's become quite an addict to the Word and things. And you have too, Brother. <laughs> brother David. <laughs> it, it's addictive, isn't it? it is. When you when you find and when you start following the Lord and, and when God starts blessing your life and touching your heart. Like Uncle Wally says, you dig it. You dig it. <laughs> <laughs> Baptists have always proselyted people by preaching the truth, by telling them the truth, by teaching truth. What I'm telling you in history is truth. I one of my students here, uh, he's a young man, he's been going to some of the student classes now in Sunday school, but he listened to my church history classes. And he's going to high school or college, I can't remember which one it is. He wrote a church history paper. And his teacher had a fit. And she said, that's not what it says in the book. That's not what it says in the history book. What you wrote down there is not what you said in the history. Where do you get this? My teacher at church. <clears throat> they went round and round. Did I ever say this? They went round and round, this guy and his teacher. Finally, he wrote this, and I think he got an A on the paper. But the teacher says, that's not what's in the book. And he said to the teacher, but that's what happened in history. And she looked at him and she said, yeah, it is. <laughs> he said, well, then, if, his, if that's true history, why can't I write true history down? Well, okay. But it did come from the book. I told you to take it out of the book. But that's not what was in the book. What I tell you is from many books. Many, many books. Lots of them. Lots of histories. I have got Right over there in that cabinet, a history of the Lutheran Church by Martin about Martin Luther. It's put out by the Lutherans, Evangelical Churches of the Lutheran Evangelical Churches, World Council of Lutheran Churches or something. And I mean, it plays him up as being a saint and a wonderful uh, child of God. But when you study real church history, the guy was what, Brother David? He was a scallywag. He was a scallywag. He was a rascal. And if you go in most Baptist churches today and they start talking about the Reformation and Protestants, he was a great leader. But Martin Luther did not bring on the Reformation. Martin Luther did not bring on the Reformation. What brought on the Reformation was the Dark Ages and people wanted out of it. And when they started hearing Baptists preach without the sword... Now, they've been fighting back and forth across England, the Muslim, Muslims and the Christian dumb. Not Christianity, but Christian dumb. Because it wasn't Christianity. When they fought back and forth, they'd push all the way to, the, to, to, to Europe and then they'd chase them all the way back. Just back and forth, seesawing back and forth in the power with a sword and making converts. Okay? Well, people began to hear the truth. And people were ready for it. In Germany, I've said this before, but in Germany, the people, the peasants in Germany demanded that the priests had concubines. Because they were seducing their wives and they were raising priest children. And they said, we're tired of raising the priests of the children. We want our children. We want our wives. And you leave our wives alone. And quit molesting our children and everything. And what had brought that on? This look back in your trail of blood chart. What had brought that on? About 1100 and something there. 1123. What do we have back there that caused this problem? Celibacy. Celibacy was invented by the Catholic Church. And they didn't let their priests marry. So when their priests couldn't marry, <coughs> God, <coughs> it is a natural thing for a man and woman want to be married. Want to find a mate. And when you change that natural thing, You've got problems. <clears throat> Preachers and deacons and church members all live under the same rules. God made us the same way. We have the same desires. We, we want to eat. We want to sleep. And we want to procreate. That's normal. All right? And God makes you that way, doesn't He? 
He created you like you are. Well, when you change that order, you've got problems. So, when did child molesting start in the Catholic Church? Big time. Right when they start right at that period of time. And here, now when is that? When did the, when did the Reformation start then? When the people got sick of that behavior, that was back in the 1100s. It was already building up. All of the, uh, the abuses. The, the rich could buy their way to heaven. Now, I have, I've said this before. And I, <clears throat> I studied. Well, I taught political science, and I studied political science a lot. And uh, <clears throat> how many of you, how many of you were alive when John Kennedy got killed? You remember where you were? What you were doing? I remember exactly where I was. Well, John Kennedy got killed. And what kind, what religiously was John Kennedy? Irish Catholic. Irish Catholic. All right. You know, America <clears throat> has not kept her skirts white always. Regard, we have to look at history really, really right. I mean, <coughs> there were some real problems back then. Castro was coming on the scene. We were fighting communism and everything else. I have a, I had a good friend. I don't still alive or not. I'm not going to mention his name or anything. But he was a hit man during this the, during this period of time. He would go down in South America, uh, especially during Reagan's period of time. And you know, we were running drugs. America was running drugs. We know that today, don't we? That's history, isn't it? Is it? Is it fact? Yeah. Yeah. Contra. They were funding the Contras how by selling drugs. I had a missionary went to school with me that went to five years to the seminary down there and he went out, went down into Columbia. Where's the drug center and things down in there? Columbia and Costa Rica and stuff down there. He went down there. He started establishing churches and everything and his pastor was D.S. Madden. Man went down there Got down there, established a bunch of churches, doing all right. All of a sudden, he just twists off. That's an oil field term. That's when you're grilling down there and you and you put too much weight on, and you twist the pipe into, and then you're in a lot of trouble, boy. You're, you've lost the pipe in the hole, and you got to try to fish it out and try to recover. You twist it off. Well, this guy twisted off. <clears throat> He went up here to Brother Mad and he's bawling and squalling on his doorstep up there in Anaheim. He says, I'm a CIA man. Running drugs. They sent me to school. <laughs> and he became a missionary. And he's down there and uh, <clears throat> studying the seminary. He went down there. He got saved while he was preaching. It's real good when you get saved. And <laughs> The woman he's living with wasn't even his wife. His kids weren't his kids. Boy, I just figure that one out now. Now that was pawned off on churches. This guy was this. This guy is a missionary. I guess he finally got straightened out and everything else. He was afraid they were going to kill him and all kinds of stuff. John Kennedy. Get back to John Kennedy. John Kennedy was an Irish Catholic, wasn't he? According to Catholicism, if you bought indulgences, would you get to heaven? No matter what kind of promiscuity or whatever. Was he a promiscuous person? Yeah. What happened to Marilyn Monroe? What do we know happened to Marilyn Monroe today? Now that the, 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 the stuff had come out. She was his lover. What happened to him, to her? Suddenly died. She suddenly died. She was leaking information that was very important. They were going to try to kill Castro. And they would made attempts on his life and everything else. Oh, what a mess. But now let's go back. Now, if, and I think Kennedy was a good president. I think he did a lot for the American people. And it got thwarted. The situation did. <clears throat> 
I'm not saying he's a bad man at all. But he was an immoral man. I think he had the... the and, and all in all, I think he had the interests of this country more in the depths of his heart and on his conscience than anything else. But now he was a Catholic, wasn't he? Now, according to Catholicism, if you bought indulgences, Brother David, and, and you were promiscuous and all this kind of stuff, were you all right? Sure. Is anything wrong with the way he lived, according to his religion? Do you think he believed that? Yeah. Sure did. He could, according to Catholicism, can you rub somebody out and still be all right if you have indulgences? If you're promiscuous, can you still be morally sound and get to heaven? This is very famous person we're talking about, isn't it? Now, let's look at it now from Catholicism's side. Was the man okay, even though what he was doing was wrong? According to the, According church, to the doctrines, yes. the dogmas of the Catholic Church, he was perfectly a, gu a good guy. Now, as we look at him from a Christian standpoint, it's not quite so good, is it? Do you believe he believed Catholicism? Sure he did. He practiced it. He believed it. <clears throat> I know a lot of Catholics. I've known some real good ones, that people that I believe were saved, and then I've known people that were not saved. In the old country, when they came over here <clears throat> to America, they brought a lot of customs with them. Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics, many of the men have concubines, mistresses. They'll, be mar they'll marry one woman, but they'll have mistresses. And if they pay for the indulgences, are they all right according to their church? Nothing wrong with that. From the Bible's point of view, are they all right? No. No. What are they? Whoremongers. As simple as that. Now, when you get this kind of people in running churches, can you see that there might be a problem with it? These are running the churches. These people like this. Now, <clears throat> on page 153 in your little church history by John T. Christian, I want to... To, to you to go there in just a minute. Now I brought another one here. This is a this is not a Baptist history, okay? This is who's who in church history. Now I want you to I'm going to read some of this to you right now. <clears throat> We're going to talk about a man by the name of Menser. His name is Munser, but it should be pronounced Menser, okay? Because when you have <clears throat> His name was basically German. When you have these little dots above a U in German, what does that make that? How do you pronounce it? Minster. Minster. It becomes an I is what it actually becomes. All right? We have Menzer and we have Minster. All right? The Minster Rebellion and we have Minzer. All right? <clears throat> now, who was this guy? This is very important in church history. I've read about him in two different books in the last week and I don't know who he is. All right, we're going to talk about him. All right? Menzer. M U N Z E R. Menzer. All right? Thomas Menser, 1489 maybe to 1525. They know when he died because he was killed by Luther. Okay? Luther had him killed. All right? Now, <clears throat> Thomas Menser, fanatical Anabaptist demagogue, Anabaptist. He was not an Anabaptist. He was not an Anabaptist. He had Anabaptist traits, but he was not an Anabaptist. They even called Calvin an Anabaptist. They even called Luther an Anabaptist, but they were not Anabaptists. Now, he was called an Anabaptist because he believed what the Anabaptists believed. But who was he? Demigod, Menzer, served briefly with Luther at Wittenberg. It's actually Wittenberg, but it's Wittenberg. That's why he's... We still have the pronunciation. 
1519, but disgustedly broke from Luther because of Luther's type of reformation was not radical enough. Munzer, or Minzer that is, claiming to instruct directly from the Holy Spirit, incited a series of peasant uprisings at Zwicken, Alstett, and <coughs> Milhausen. Although thrown out of the three towns, he returned to Milhausen and seized control and set up a theocracy which all property was held in common. He was outraged both the Protestants and the Catholics alike. Who's the Protestants, by the way? The, the Lutherans and the Calvinists. The Lutherans and the Calvinists. That's who the Protestants were. They didn't even consider Anabaptists Protestants at all at that time. And we should not be considered Protestants today. We are Baptists. That is a high calling of God. We are not Protestants. Not a real Baptist is not a Protestant. He was a uh, Baptist were around long before the Protestants came along. And we didn't come out of the Catholic Church protesting the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church left us. They left the truth. We protested their protested against their errors all this time. preaching civil turmoil and finally defeated in battle by Philip Landgrave of Hesse in 1525 under Martin Luther's direction. The unstable radical was executed. Menzer helped give the Anabaptists a bad name in many parts of Europe in many years. It says right here that, that he was an Anabaptist, but he wasn't. Now let's go on page 153. And by the way, that's who's who in church history. And if you want to go back and look at that one, that's on page 220... 199 and 200. I'm going to try to get past this thing tonight. Why was Mincer so... Such a fantastic preacher. What made him so great? Dakota, did you learn about Minster or Minzer? The Minster Rebellion in your church in your history classes? Marilyn, you ever hear about him? I heard <coughs> you, but I can't recall. All right. The peasant wars and turmoil of Minster, because of the Baptists had been charged with the wildest vulgarities and instigating horrible tumults. And wars. The Baptists were accused of doing this. <clears throat> the most searching investigation has failed to prove that Menzer, the leader of the riots and the peasant wars, was a Baptist at all, or that the Baptists were anywise responsible for these uprisings. <clears throat> what we have here, why did not Menzer agree with Luther? What did Luther do? What was the Lutheran church in Germany? State, state church. Who was uh, Luther having dinner with? Who was he hunting with? Who was he traveling with? The royalty of the upper echelon of Germany. <clears throat> and now since we only have probably a 2% or 1% of the population there that is this upper crust, who are the rest of them? The peons. The peons. Who have Baptists always lived among? <clears throat> Brother Mike told me before, he said, I like to hear you preach because you preach and I can go to your house and see you were living like a farmer and out there working and doing all this kind of stuff and you're a human just like me. Because that's what I am. I preach. I've given a lot of my life to study in God's Word. Minster was like this. I'm going to tell you, he was a common man. He was a brilliant man. And he had a compassion and a heart for lost people and lost poor people. Now, Baptists were reaching a lot of poor people. Most Baptists were poor. And they reached Minster also. The most searching investigation has failed to prove that he had anything to do with Baptists at all. There had long been trouble between the peasants and the nobility. Many times in different localities during the preceding 100 years had the oppressed peasants in Central Europe attempted to throw off the yoke of their feudal lords that laid upon them. Have you ever heard of counts and princes and all of this? 
<coughs> heavy burdens have been placed upon laboring classes by, by their lay and ecclesiastical masters. It happened in Catholicism and it happened in the Lutheran church too. The forcible repression of evangelical doctrines was an added grievance. Leonard Fry, secretary of the city of Wittsburg, who gathered the documentary evidence that time writing in the spirit of the age calls the uprising a deluge. He cannot be doubted that many of these grievances call for a response, a redress. Now again, the peasants were in revolt. The leader of the movement was Thomas Mincer, born in Stolzburg, at the foot of the Hartz Mountain. Have you heard of Hartz Mountain? Dakota, have you ever heard of Hartz Mountain? Yeah, but what, where do you see it? When you go into the pet stores, you ever hear of Hartz Mountain? Okay, that's where this comes from, that little, all those pet things, little different things. Okay, Hartz Mountain. He had been a priest, but became a disciple of Luther. He was a great favorite of the Reformer. His deformment was remarkably grave. His countenance was pale, his eye was sunk, as if absorbed in thought, his visage long, and he wore no beard. You know, beards back then, they wore beards to show superiority also. His talent lay in the plain and easy method of preaching to the country people, <coughs> whom it would seem as an itinerant he taught almost throughout the electorate of Saxony. His air of mortification won him the hearts of rustics. It was singular than for a preacher of so much ability to appear humble. Thank you, brother. It was singular then for a preacher of so much ability to appear humble. When he had finished his sermon in any village, he used to run away. He'd retire. He didn't want to be greeted by the masses. Either to avoid the crowd or devote himself to meditation and prayer. This was a practice so very singular and uncommon. Most of them wanted to be out there and be patted on the back and stand out there like a big proud peacock. that the people used to throng about the door to peep through the crevices and windows and oblige him sometimes to let them in, though he repeatedly assured them that he was nothing. That all he had come that all had come from above, and that admiration and praise were due only to God. The more he fled from applause, the more it followed him. The people called him Luther's curate. Uh oh. What happened in David's time when Saul? What happened with Saul and David? Saul tried to kill him. Tried to kill him. Why? When David walked in the city after he slew uh, had slew different people, what did they say? David, Saul slew his hundreds, and David slew his ten thousands. They were lifting David above Saul. Who's the big shot on the scene here? Who's the big shot? Luther. And Luther called him his Absalom. What did Absalom do to David now? What did David's son Absalom do to him? Huh? He went out there and, and he became a judge. He said, oh, don't go to my father. Come to me and I'll give you a true judgment. And he got out there and he, and he conned the people. Luther called him his Absalom probably because he stole the hearts of the men of Israel like Absalom did and basically like David did with Saul without ever trying. The peasants set forth their views in 12 articles. Some of them said that they were written by Hidmeyer, but there is no proof of this. The eloquent appeal for human liberty. Sounds like early America, doesn't it? Why did America get founded? What was the reason? What happened? Why did people come to America, Marilyn? Liberty. And liberty. Dakota, quote me the first line of the preamble to the Constitution. All right. Very good. 
Very good. And he gets down to liberty. Liberty and pursuit of happiness. What was the Reformation? An awakening. What was a what was a renaissance? What was a renaissance? A waking up. That's when they had some of the most beautiful paintings in history. Before that, everything was dull and, and, and childlike. Did you know that? Look at the paintings before that. Look, child, look like some kids have been drawn. Even in the churches. All geometric. And all of a sudden you can see real form. When the peasants arrived in any village, they caused articles to be read, wherever this was. All right, we have the Mincer Rebellion. We have all of this. But now, who was Mincer? He was a Lutheran. He was a radical sect of the Lutheran Church in all reality. A radical sect of the Lutheran Church. He was a Lutheran. He was a Lutheran that did not agree with Calvin, or with, the, with Luther. And he was a man of the common then, wasn't he? What were his beliefs? His, his beliefs, beliefs. He, he, he started adopting Anabaptist beliefs, is what he did. He believed in salvation by grace. He believed that God was not a respecter of persons. He believed that church houses were no more important than a cave to meet in. They started tearing up church buildings. Tearing them down in some places. They're tearing them down. We don't need them. And <clears throat> I know this is kind of upset somebody, but where that some of the greatest uh, pieces of, of uh, music and the great operas so it was called, but they were religious offers like Bach and Beethoven. Where did these originate? Where did it originate? In churches. They had great orchestras. And Baptists at that period of time, and they had great organs, great orchestras, and music of all kinds, and it was supported by the state church. And what happened? It's going over a little bit tonight. What happened? What, how did Baptists react to these great orchestras and stuff? How did they react? They didn't, so they didn't want music. Right? They didn't want any music. They didn't want any instrument of music in the churches only, but only singing. They wanted God to hear their voices. So that old belief in no instruments came from Anabaptists. That came from the Anabaptist movement. And Minster was propagating this. Basically, if the pagans were doing it, they weren't. Yes, they go completely the opposite. Now, there's nothing wrong with music in church. But if the state church and if Catholicism, all of these great orchestras and orchestrations that we have today, even as beautiful they were, was purported by state churches. Baptists were singing. Shall we gather at the river? You know, simple things. But that's a biblical view because God wanted Israel to be separate from the pagans yes. and instructed them to do things. Yeah. But did Israel? But did Israel have musical instruments in God's services? Yes, sir. Did. Can you see why Baptists might have gone a little bit too far radical the other way? Now, what was Luther doing? I mean, not Luther, but Menser. He was lining up with the Anabaptists, not because he was an Anabaptist but because he saw truth. Truth is truth, isn't it? Because the Word of God spoke. Yeah. What was he preaching? The Word of God. The Word of God. All right. That was good on him. Good on him. It cost him his life. But he preached the truth. And he preached uh, against the establishment. Against the establishment. He said that it was wrong to do this. It was wrong to be... <clears throat> he came... Luther came from Catholicism, didn't he? Calvin came from Catholicism. What do you have in Catholicism? You have great pomp and ceremony, don't you? Hmm. All the big bands and all the big processions. Well, there was one pope in a solemn procession one time that had a baby. <clears throat> she was actually a girl. 
And she was pregnant. She had a baby. They had to stop the procession and, and, until she delivered the baby. All of her garb and stuff on. You couldn't even tell what she looked like. She had all kinds of this fine around. You couldn't tell if she was pregnant. This is, this is history also. Church history. Catholic history. It happened. All that pomp and ceremony and all the blowing of the great horns and everything. There's nothing wrong with instrumental music at all. But at that time, the instrumental music was coming from the dark side. It didn't come from God's people. They were just singing in caves and in homes and things. I think in the last days, that there won't be any church houses and church buildings where people meet during the during the tribulation period. I think real Christians, people that are converted there, will be meeting in caves and they will meeting be hiding in homes and out in the deserts and wherever. <coughs> I have something else to read to you. That, are you guys getting tired? Are you all right? Okay, let's go. This is a long class, but. I want to cover this little area here. I got a uh, a paper here that the Lutherans. Now we're talking about Luther, aren't we? Uh, who had Minster killed? Martin Luther. Was Luther was Martin Luther uh, tolerant religiously? No. Was he any more tolerant than the Catholic Church was? What was he originally? He was a Catholic priest. He went out of there protesting things that he didn't like about Catholicism. But what actually he did, he became a Pope. <clears throat> and he was rubbing elbows. He was sitting down at the great banquet tables. He was hunting with a... You know, in Europe, if you were a peasant and you were hungry, Dakota, you couldn't go out and hunt a rabbit and kill it. I know you love animals and things like that, but you couldn't fish in the stream and catch a fish. You couldn't go out and, and shoot or, or catch a rabbit or uh, a quail. They were the kings. They belonged to All of it belonged to the lords and the princes and the counts. And Luther could go out and he could hunt among these things. He was rubbing elbows with them because what was he? Aristocracy. He was aristocracy also. Men's are why he split with him because he was a common man. Men's was a object of Luther's hate. He did not tolerate anyone else. Germany was a state, a church state, state, country. <clears throat> Declaration of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America on the condemnation of Anabaptists. During the 16th century of Reformation in Central Europe, a variety of statements were made representatives of the churches of Augsburg Confession condemning the teaching of of Anabaptists, those who denied infant baptism, those in the Reformers' view practiced rebaptism. In our own in our own century, these statements and condemnations have become highly problematic. The Lutheran Church, not only for our relationship with the Mennonite Church in USA and other Christians, problematic, who trace their heritage to 16th century. Anabaptist reformers, but also for our own self-understanding as a part of one holy Catholic and apostolic church. One holy... The Mennonites today believe in a universal church, brother. That's the problem. The universal church is also called the church what? The church Catholic. That's the big. Well, these are all the believers gathered together, and they make up the church of God. Okay, that's not true. The church is that body of believers that God gave authority to carry the gospel out till He came back. That's who that church was. Those Mennonites and those Anabaptists were all part of that at that time. Luther was never had anything to do with it. Catholicism never had anything to do with it. But we have the Catholic Church. We have the Church Universal, the Church Catholic. We need... This is one very extreme important point in church history. What is the church? What are the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ? And what is the saved? I'm telling you, there could be people saved in, in, in Lutheran churches, even in Catholic churches. There could be people saved in Presbyterian churches. But the Lord's churches 
are those churches that trace themselves back to these pre-Protestants people. Particularly in the light of the dialogues between Lutherans and Mennonites in Europe in the later decades of the 20th century, in light of exploratory conversations between the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Mennonite Church in USA, 2002 through 2004, it is desirable to clarify the focus of those 16th century condemnation. That's in the 1500s. That's where we are, too, by the way. That's what happened. That's where we are tonight. And it is possible, in most cases, specific to the reject the applicability to the Mennonite church of the USA. In other words, we're not going to condemn the Mennonites anymore. I haven't said anything about the Baptists yet. <clears throat> the sources. The condemnations of the Anabaptists by the 16th century Lutheran derive from several sources which, with, with different levels of authority for present-day Lutherans. One source includes the judgments of individual persons like Martin Luther and Philip Malachathon. Remember, we just talked about him a while ago. However, because of their roles in the formation of the Lutheran practice and doctrine, many contemporary Lutherans and Mennonites may regard their statements as having continuing authority or influence. Some of these writings demonstrate the misunderstanding that Anabaptist teaching in general was sedacious and treasonous and warranted capital punishment. What's capital punishment, Dakota? Death. Death. Did they kill Baptists? Did they kill Mincer? Mm -hmm. In most cases, however, the articles being condemned were not taught by Menno Simmons or any other Baptist reformers considered to be forebears of the Mennonite church. A second source of condemnation is the formula of Concord in 1577, a document written. Now, this is written by the Lutheran church. This is not an enemy of the Lutheran church. This is the Lutheran church. Written to resolve disputes between Lutherans, which condemned series of erroneous statements that were not to be tolerated or permitted in church public affairs, domestic life within Lutheran territories. What does that mean? The state church was not going to allow anybody to preach anything differently than what they did in their territories or you'd kill them. And it tells the different things here. While apparently aware that Anabaptists were divided in many different groups, the condemned teachings were ascribed to Anabaptists in general. If you were Anabaptists, you were a dead meat. That's all. At any time when the civil authorities resolved religious differences, the failure to identify which Anabaptists taught these errors led to the imprisonment, exile, execution of persons not guilty of the errors. In most cases, the condemned articles were not taught by the Anabaptists at all. But they were considered forebears of the Mennonite Church of the USA. Third source. This is not written by an enemy of Lutherans. This is written by the Lutherans. <clears throat> the source of condemnation is the Augsburg Confession of Faith, because John Eck, Eck, that is, and others had accused the Lutheran reformers of being Anabaptists themselves. Remember what I told you about a while ago? These articles sought first to demonstrate their continuity with the apostolic faith, and secondly, to condemn the Anabaptists and others who teach what they judged to be in conflict with the apostolic faith. The Augsburg Confession did not, however, attempt to clarify which groups of Anabaptists adhered to the rejected teaching. In most cases, the condemned articles were not taught by the Anabaptist reformers and considered the forebears of the Mennonite Church of the USA. Two of these articles, on baptismal faith and the practice on participation in the police power of the state, may, in fact, apply to the teaching. Mendel Simmons and other Anabaptist forebears, additional dialogue is necessary to ascertain whether they apply. Also to the teaching and doctrine of Mennonite Church in the USA. Our declaration today now is the Evangelical Lutheran Council of Churches repudiates the use of governmental authorities to punish individuals or groups with whom it disagrees theologically. They don't think we ought to be killed now, brother. We reject any arguments of Luther and Malachathon in which they hold the government authorities should punish Anabaptists for their teachings. We also repudiate the use of statements in the formal concord to the same effect. 
Although the Vandalical Lutheran Church believes that the modern state has a duty to restrain evil and promote good in the world, no church should use the state to impose on its own beliefs and practices on others. They don't believe in the state church anymore, but they are practicing state churches, aren't they? We express our deep and abiding sorrow and regret for the persecution, suffering visited upon Adirondack Baptists during the religious disputes of the past. The Lutherans and the Albert Confession made indirect references to teaching professed by some people often associated with Anabaptists and sometimes named as forebearers of the Mennonite USA Church. Furthermore, we note that direct reference to Anabaptists in this confession, specifically so-and-so and so-and-so, described the teachings of a few people who, apart from denying the efficacy of infant baptism, had little in common with the theological with the forebears of the Mennonite Church, declares that all such condemnations in the council do not apply in any form to today's Mennonite Church of the USA. The Augsburg Confession condemns the Anabaptists in a manner of baptismal faith and practice and participation in the police power of the state and are properly the subject of future conversation between our churches. Did you catch that one? Maybe we need to do this still in certain cases. We note that Luther, <clears throat> that Lutheran churches in France and Germany have adopted statements declaring that these condemnations are not church dividing and that they do not apply to Mennonites in their countries. The Lutheran World Federation has begun conversation with the Mennonite World Conference and we support their efforts to ascertain whether the differences that remain between our two churches in this matter are in fact church dividing. You know what this all says right here? that the Mennonite church has changed enough where they don't think that they're a threat to them anymore. Ecumenical letter. Yeah. That's an ecumenical letter. Beware of that type of thing. We've got a thing on Calvin for next week. Thank you for for putting up with our little extra time tonight. Let's have a word of prayer and I'll turn you loose on the world. Did you learn something? Did you learn who Minster was now? You got a pretty good idea who he was? Wasn't too bad of an old boy, was it? No. He was trying to defend the poor. And the state church wasn't going to allow it. Because they were still in power and they were going to keep the poor under the thumb and the rich were going to be right where they were and the princes and the and the counts and everything were going to be right in place exactly where they were. Brother David, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, brother? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just consider it a privilege to come to your house, Lord, and to learn more about your word and about history. Father, we just thank you for Brother Jim that he's, he can uh, impart these things.